Tonight being our fifth Sunday, we want to open our service to any biblical questions that you might have. Could be one of the messages you've heard here this morning or over the last few weeks, something you've read or heard this uh, just this past week, or just a question that you've been uh, wondering about for some time. We're going to open it up this time for that. Does anybody have a question to start us off? Jonathan. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. That's that's a good question. The question is, uh, when Moses asked God. Show me your glory. I mean, that, that was really the request that he had. And why did God respond the way that he did? Um, Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Understand that this is after Moses has gone to Egypt, uh, performed the miracles of the plagues on Egypt. Finally, Pharaoh lets the children of Israel go. They've gone into the wilderness. He's already received the Ten Commandments. So a lot of things have happened leading up to this point. In Exodus 33... Beginning in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Moses is feeling the burden of leadership. You know, he's been tasked with leading the nation of Israel out, and, and he's feeling that burden. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Really ties in with this morning's message and what's coming up next month. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord asked, or said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. The Lord is reassuring Moses, you're the man I want, you're right where you need to be, and I'm going to grant you this request to show you that I'm pleased with you and, and you're the man for the job. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, Yahweh, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. 
when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the, in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. What's up with all this? Well, understand first of all, this is filled with what theologians call anthropomorphic expressions, which means giving God physical attributes so that we can understand. God is spirit. He does not have a large body like we do. Technically speaking, God does not have a face, he does not have a hand, he does not have a back. But he puts it in these ways, you use the phrase dumb it down, <laughs> that God dumbs it down for all of us so that we can have a bit of comprehension uh, into who he is and how he operates. He is so far beyond us that he is putting it in terms we can understand. Now, why is it that God says no one can see my face and live? This deals with the holiness of God. God is so incredibly holy that nothing sinful can stand in his presence. And even though our sins may be forgiven, we are still sinful people. We're still in these corrupted bodies, and we are not able in this state to see God directly because His holiness is often likened in the Bible to a fire and it would just consume us. It would burn us up. Um, I kind of think of that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the guys look into the Ark of the Covenant and they just like melt and burn away and all that. That's kind of the impression that we get, if someone were to look at God directly, that's what would happen. And so God says, no one can see me and live. So I am going to protect you. My glory is going to pass in front of you, but I'm going to protect you, Moses, so that you're not consumed with it. Now we do know that after Moses came down from the mountain, after being with God, it said that his face glowed like the sun to the point that the people were afraid of him and said, cover yourself up so that, you know, you're freaking us out with a glowing face. Uh, so even the indirect exposure to God's glory transformed Moses. Uh, but God was saying, because of my holiness, you cannot see me directly and live. Now here's the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. In the New Testament, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And when you get to Revelation, and it talks about our eternal home, we will see God. Because by that time, we will have received our glorified bodies that will be perfectly sinless, and we will be able to encounter the holiness of God and it won't burn us up. So that's something we have to look forward to. But the reason why this happened with Moses is to demonstrate God's immense holiness. And that even as believers, even, you know, Moses was someone that you know, God was pleased with him. God put him where he was to be. In fact, this whole episode of his glory was to show and reassure Moses that, yes, I am with you. But there, even at that, there had to be kind of a safeguard so that Moses himself wasn't consumed. Good question. Yes, Zoe. Yes. Yep. Right. Yes. He's still going to be spirit. Yes. God, and when I say that, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit retain their spirit form. God the Son, who became Jesus, we will see him in his body because he still has his glorified body. So Jesus, uh, in essence, sacrificed his omnipresence so that he is in one place at one time. That's part of the incarnation. So we will see Jesus 
in his glorified body. How we will see God, though God is a spirit, I honestly don't know. Uh, that, that's, I believe it. I believe that we will, and I don't have any doubt about it, but how that will happen, I, I can't say. Now, you bring up the idea that we're created in the image of God. That is true. Uh, and the Bible says it over and over, so it, it's, it is definitely a fact. We tend to think of the image, you know, being in the image of God, well, it must be the way we look. No, I don't think it is. I think we're created in the image of God in the kind of personality we are. We have an intellect. We have emotions. We have the ability to choose. We can make moral decisions as God can. And I believe that is the way we were created in God's image. Not that God has a head and hands and feet and all of that. So it's not a physical likeness. It's more of a spiritual likeness. Well, it, it may be. It may be that we will not see God with our eyes it, as such, or maybe what we will see is that bright light of his glory, but we won't see a form because God doesn't have a form. You say, why, why wouldn't God have a form? Because that would limit him. And God is limitless. You know, and God is everywhere at once, and if he had a form, that would, there would be somewhere where God isn't. <laughs> and so, um, how we will see God... I'm not sure. And it may not be a physical sight. It may be what you're talking about, an awareness of his presence. Um, we're really not given details. Uh, but we do know that it'll be different than it was for Moses. Moses was not permitted to see God's face and live. But one day we will. And we will live to tell about it. I actually have a question that was given to me in advance, and the person who asked the question isn't able to be here, but I'm going to address it anyway. And it has to do with the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, something we're, I'm sure, familiar with, we end every morning worship service by praying together the Lord's Prayer. And there is a line in that prayer that has cause questions, and it's a good question. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Jesus says, This then is how you should pray. Our, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the sticking point. Why do we pray, lead us not into temptation, when the Bible clearly tells us that God doesn't tempt anyone? And where you see that is in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And this is a good exercise because one of the basic elements of understanding Scripture is the Bible does not contradict itself. And in James chapter 1, verse 13, it doesn't get any clearer than this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So God does not tempt, and yet Jesus tells us to pray, lead us not into temptation. What is up with that? And the answer comes in really to that word temptation. We tend to think of temptation as an enticement to do something wrong. We are tempted to sin. 
And clearly that's what James had in mind when he says God does not tempt anyone to sin. Because again, he is holy. We come back to the holiness of God. So if God cannot tempt anyone to sin, if we are never to say God is tempting me because he cannot tempt anyone, why do we pray that way? Understand that Initially, temptation did not only mean an enticement to do evil. It was used as a test. And a test is not only the opportunity to do wrong. A test is an opportunity to do right or wrong. And there are places in Scripture where it says God tests people. One that comes off the top of my head is Genesis 22.1. God tested Abraham. Now, if you go back in the King James Version, it says God tempted Abraham. Whoa, wait a minute. James says that God doesn't tempt, and Genesis says God tempted Abraham. And you say, what did God tempt Abraham to do? Sacrifice his own son, kill him on an altar, That sounds like murder. That sounds like sin. So how could God tempt Abraham to do something wrong? And the truth is, he did not. He tested Abraham. He gave Abraham the opportunity to do right. In the same way, when God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and said, you may eat of any tree of the garden but one... Stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Was God tempting Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the, gar- of the knowledge of good and evil? No. The serpent came along and did that. Satan is the one who tempts us to do wrong. But we often find tests where we can either do what is right or do what is wrong. And I believe that when Jesus said to pray, lead us not into temptation, he's not saying that God tempts us to do wrong. That violates God's word. It also violates God's holy character. He does not tempt anyone to do sin. So when somebody says, well, God told me to do this and it's clearly wrong. No, it wasn't God telling them to do that. They are mistaken or delusional. So God does not tempt us to sin. I think maybe the the idea of this statement, what Jesus is teaching us to pray, could be summarized as, let us not sin when tested. Or I like the way one person put it, Do not allow us to be so led into temptation that it overwhelms us, but rescue us from the evil one. And that's actually the next line in the prayer. Deliver us from evil. Really, it's the word deliver is a word that can be translated rescue. I think it's a really good way of of thinking of that verse. Rescue us from the evil. There is a definite pronoun there in that line so it's not just deliver us from evil in a generic sense it's the evil the evil one so what we're praying here lord keep me from the evil one who is going to try to drag me away to sin so it's not god that tempts us and the correct understanding of what Jesus is saying here is when we are tested, when we are indeed tempted, help us not to fall into sin. Show us that way of escape, which 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, um, with every temptation there is a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. So that's the understanding of that line. Zoe? Yes, God does allow Satan to tempt us. And a great example of that is seen in the life of Jesus 
where it says the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So God did not tempt Jesus. The, Satan tempts. Satan is the one who tempts. And so, yes, God allows those temptations. And this is where there is a promise. No temptation is taken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful and he will always provide a way out so that you're able to bear it. You hear a lot of people say, God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not true. There are a lot of scriptures that say, God gives us more than we can handle. Now, not more than he can handle, but more than we can handle on our own. He wants us to depend on him. But when it comes to sin, when it comes to temptation, God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can handle. So we have no excuse. We can't say the devil made me do it. You know, we, we can't blame anybody else. Now, Adam and Eve tried, you know. God said, what have you done? And they're like, it's their fault. It's your fault. Uh, we have no excuse because God always provides a way out. So while he allows Satan to tempt us, he still has the control. Remember the story of Job. You know, Satan says... You let me have Job, and, and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, all right, Satan, but here's your parameters. You can't go beyond this. Initially, it was, you can take away his stuff, but you can't touch him. And when that didn't work, Satan's like, yeah, skin for skin. You know, anybody will uh, give up what they have as long as they protect themselves. And then God says, all right, you can afflict him, but you can't kill him. Trust me, Satan would love to have killed Job. So God is still in control. And while God allows Satan to do work, he can only work within his, his limits. Uh, think of Satan as being on a leash. And God's holding the leash. He can do some things, but only what God lets him do. And then God says, nope, that's it. You can't go any farther. And in that way, God is still in control. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Curse God and die. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what Satan will do. Satan does not play fair. Satan has no moral guide or rules you know the only the only limits he has are what god limits him to but he will use anybody anything um he is not fair and and he will often use things we don't expect whom did he use to try to get jesus off track simon peter you know, the Lord's closest person here on earth, you know, the leader of the disciples, and that's whom Satan tried to get Jesus off track with. You know, with Job, it was his wife, you know, and his friends, those closest to him. He'll do that. And it, it's that can be tough. Yes. That's a very good point. The closer we get to God the harder Satan works on us. Conversely, as we drift further and further away from God, Satan's not going to mess with us because we're really not much of a threat. So if you, you feel like Satan hasn't been tempting you for a while or it feels like you've been left alone, you might want to you know take a look at some things. <laughs> Maybe I need to get closer to God. Okay, good question, good question. What is the difference between Satan and demons? And actually, I got a question related to this this last week. Um, are all fallen angels 
demons? And the answer is yes. Demons are angels, all right? As far as a class of being, demons are not human. Demons are not divine. They're not God. They are angels. Angels is a distinct species, you might say. Uh, angels are not people. That's one thing Hollywood has got us all messed up on. We think that if someone dies, they get their wings and they become an angel. Eh, no, that would actually be a step down for human. Um, God created us in his image. It never says God created the angels in his image. He actually created angels to serve us. So angels are a complete different class of beings. They're not God, they're not human. Now, within the realm of angels or angelic beings, you have the angels who stayed true to God, and those might we might call good angels. Those are ones that God still uses today to bring about His will. Then you have fallen angels, or evil spirits, or demons. These are angels that God initially created and created good. They were morally good. But at one point in time, they had a choice. Are you going to stay true to God? Or are you going to leave God? I believe that little letter of Jude right before the book of Revelation Jude verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, okay, they did not stay with what God created them to do, they rebelled. Now I believe that that rebellion took place and one of the chief angels, in fact, the Bible seems to indicate he was the chief angel called Lucifer, rebelled against God, decided, I want to be like God. I will be above the Most High. Uh, you see that in Isaiah 14. He rebelled against God, and he took with him one-third of the angels. All right, and that is seen in Revelation 12. It's kind of uh, obscure. It talks about the dragon, and he swept one third of the stars out of the sky with his tail. Most interpreters understand that to mean he took one third of the angels with him when he rebelled against God. So Satan, by definition, is a demon. He is a fallen angel but he is the head of all of the fallen angels. So Satan is a demon, and Satan has a large number of demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, fallen angels, they all mean the same thing. And they report to him and they do his work. So in a sense, Satan is a demon, but he is the for, first and foremost among the demons. And as such, he's a created being, so he is not a rival with God. He is still way under God, uh, but he is the head of the evil that's happening in our universe. Zoe. Uh, uh, does he control the demons? In a sense, yes, he he is uh, he he controls in the way of he has authority over them. So, and the way Paul talks about it in his letters, demons are organized very much like an army. They have ranks, you know, and you have you know your senior officers, your junior officers, and and so it seems as though the demons are very organized in that way, and Satan is is the the commander in chief of the demons. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, good question. Um, 
the, the one third of the angels who Satan took with him, was that their own choice? I believe he was. Um, now, Jude talks about those who abandoned their own home. Uh, and that speaks of a definite decision on their part. Now, the question came up because that verse also says, These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Does that mean that all the demons are imprisoned at this time? And the answer to that is no. Not all demons are imprisoned. Some are. And they are imprisoned in what the Bible calls the pit or the abyss. The Greek term is Tartarus. It is kind of the angelic equivalent of Hades. Both of them are temporary waiting places. They're like holding cells for those beings awaiting judgment. In the time of Christ's rule and reign on earth, Satan is going to be locked up in that abyss for a period of about a thousand years. Uh, there are demons who are there right now. Other demons don't want to go there. If you'll remember when Jesus encountered the man at, at the, the Gerasenes, uh, was among the he was hiding or living in the cemetery and would break the chains, and you know, he had a legion of demons. Remember what they said to Jesus? They begged him repeatedly, don't send us to the pit. All right? They didn't want to go there. Now, Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 both refer to some angels who are there. And in fact, Revelation makes a reference to them in one of the judgments God allows these demons out. Those are the beings that look like locusts and had the long flowing hair and all that, tormenting mankind for five months. Those are actually the demons Jude's talking about here. And I believe that, uh, and the Jewish interpretation of this is, those were the demons spoken of in Genesis 6, where the sons of God married the daughters of men, and you had this kind of mutant race that came about from that, really led to the flood that those are the angels that were locked away. For reasons that God himself knows, he said they are too dangerous to let out amongst creation. And so he, he has them locked away. Now he will let them out for a short time, and they wreak havoc on the earth. Uh, but when it talks in, in Jude 6, He's not talking about all fallen angels. This is a group of fallen angels who are being kept in the pit. Okay, good question. Good question. Can, can one demon inhabit more than one being? I don't have a scripture on that. I'm going to say no. I don't believe that one demon can inhabit more than one person. It is possible for multiple demons to inhabit one person. But I don't believe that a demon can inhabit one person and another person over here. They're, they're separate beings. So uh, now, again, I don't have a, a chapter and verse where I can base that on, but I, I'm just trying to think. I don't recall where there's ever a case where one demon could inhabit different beings at the same time. Right. right. Well, yeah, and, and that could be a whole group of demons because understand, you know, Jesus said I could call 10,000 angels to come. Uh, the number of angels that were created, one-third of whom are now on Satan's side, number into the tens of thousands. We don't know for sure how many there are, but there are a lot. And so you might have a group where every person in that group could be inhabited by a demon. But I don't believe that one demon would inhabit more than one person. That's a, that's a conclusion. That's not a revelation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes. Okay, good question. Good question. The demons who asked Jesus to send them into the pigs, and then the pigs ran down into the water and were drowned, what happened to the demons then? They were released. Because once the pigs were dead, they were released and they could go, they could go on. Um, demons, by and large, want something to inhabit. Because when they have some physical body, whether it's animal or human, they're able to use, use and manipulate that body to do things that they can't do otherwise. So they, they prefer to find a place to inhabit. Uh, but because their nature is so destructive, when they inhabited those pigs, the pigs ran off into the water and drowned uh, just because of their the, the evil nature of the demons. It, it really it wasn't so much about the pigs. You know, the pigs were not suicidal. The demons made them that way. Poor pigs. This is true. Yes. But blessed was the man who got rid of those demons. <laughs> Bob, did you have a question? Yes, yes. That is true, yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, if a demon is cast out of a person, can they go and inhabit someone else? And the, the answer is yes. In fact, Jesus even talks about a man who had a demon cast out of him. The demon went and tried to find another person to inhabit, didn't find one, came back and found that person had swept out their life and, you know, everything was clean, but it was empty and went and got seven demons more wicked than himself and they all came back and inhabited that same person. Uh, so, yes, it, when, when a demon, even if a demon is cast out, they can come back unless, and, and here, here's where the promise comes in, I do not believe that a demon can inhabit a human who has the Holy Spirit living in them. I do not believe that a demon and God the Holy Spirit can indwell an individual at the same time. So, if a person has a demon cast out of them and they invite the Spirit in them, that demon cannot come back. Now, I do believe that demons can oppress believers, which is kind of pressuring from the outside, but I don't believe they can get in. I don't believe they can take up residence, what we would call demon possession. I don't believe that can happen for a true believer in Christ. John? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, how do, how do we prepare for uh, the work of demons all around us? And, and believe me, they're all around us. You know, if we could see into the spirit realm, it'd probably freak us all out when we saw the demons and the angels that are at work because they're here. Um, my answer to that would be Ephesians 6. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand in the evil day. And remember, I... Honestly, I think the most important verse in that whole chapter is not about the armor itself. It says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers of darkness. It's, it's the demons. And, and that's really who our battle is with. I've always said, if you can see them, they're not the enemy. <laughs> now, the enemy might be using them. You know, the enemy might be manipulating someone to do evil things. But again, they're not the enemy the enemy is the evil forces that are at work. And so our best defense, number one, have the Spirit living in you. Um, the blood of Jesus is our protection because 
We've been redeemed by the blood, purchased by his blood, and Satan can't do anything about that. Um, I think of how Passover got started. The blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost and the death angel passed over them. They were protected by the blood. We are protected by the blood of Christ. And, and that's a good reminder. When Satan starts you know, working at us and, and trying to prompt us to do wrong, hey, I've got the blood. And if, if you've ever had to deal with someone who was demon-possessed, you better make sure you're covered by the blood. Uh, that's not something you want to mess with. Ask the seven sons of Sceva. Yes. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, it talks about um, the spiritual forces of evil in high places. Uh, I believe the NIV talks about the heavenly realms. And that doesn't mean heaven like way, way away. That means in the spirit realm. Uh, not in the physical realm so much. Now they are here, they're present, but it's not, again, our enemies are not physical. Our enemies are spiritual. And you talk about those high places, uh, I think there's a lot of applications for that. Places of power, places of authority, places of influence. Government, I think, would definitely fit into that category. But think of other entities in our culture that is very influential. The media, right? Entertainment, you know, the music industry, the movie industry, uh, even the nightly news, you know, these are high places. These are places of influence. And you better believe Satan is utilizing them. Yes, yes. Sad to say, oh, there is. Sad to say, even in religious programming on television, which, I mean, it can be a great thing. And there are some good ones, all right? You know, Charles Stanley has had a great ministry on television. David Jeremiah, there are some good ones. But right now, for every good one you can find, you can probably find 10 of them that are preaching a false gospel. And you better believe Satan is absolutely there. And you say, why are... They're very wealthy. I was just going to say, why are there so many false preachers on TV as compared to true ones? And it's because of the wealth. That's right. And that false doctrine that they teach helps generate money. And you've got to have a lot of money to be on television. And that's what precludes a lot of ministers from doing that. Of course, now we have YouTube and you can do it for free. Yes. Cults, yes, good, that's true. And cults, what we mean by cults are religions that are not true. Now, a lot of cults can use the name of Jesus, all right? You have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, Jesus Christ, they must be Christian. No, they're not. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah is kind of a corruption of the name of God in the Old Testament. Oh, well, they must be legit. No, they're not. Uh, so be careful. You know, just because they have the name Christ or they have the name God does not mean they're, they're truthful. Uh, and so when you have cults and you say, okay, what's the difference between a cult and just a, another church or denomination? And it really boils down to Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Christ. Right. Most of them do, they reject his deity. They don't believe he's God. Oh, he was a great teacher. He was a great philosopher. He was a martyr. I mean, they, all these things. But unless he is God, they're a cult. If they try to say, oh, he's the son of God because God the Father created him. That's a cult. That's heresy. Because if he's created, he's not God. Um, now, you mentioned cults, and cults are false religions, and many of them do use the name of God or Jesus. I also want to introduce you to another word that's very similar, but it has a different meaning, and that's the occult. O-C-C-U-L-T. Occult. 
That is where you get into demons. All right, that's when you're dealing with spirits. And I want to tell you something. Right now, in our culture, the occult is very pro prominent and prevalent and becoming increasingly popular. If you notice, in one of those high places that we were talking about in the entertainment field, it used to be around Halloween you'd have scary movies come out. Now it's year-round. And you're seeing not only the typical kind of horror movies, but you're seeing so much of it is involved in the supernatural. A lot of witchcraft. A lot of angels and demons. And usually when Hollywood deals with angels and demons, they get it all wrong. Um, they're not led by the truth of Scripture. Um, you're seeing it really appealing to the younger generation. And there is a renewed interest in the occult, in trying to uh, get into you know, the spirit realm and, and contacting spirits of the dead. The Bible is very clear. Don't mess with that stuff. Because you're not dealing with dead spirits. You're dealing with demons impersonating those dead spirits. Uh, and you're playing literally with fire. I believe that I believe that is true. I now I believe to some degree that's going to depend on on the individual. But uh, I would say for someone who may not be strong in the faith, um, someone who might be impressionable, you know, even a novel that deals with witchcraft or especially one that glorifies witchcraft is probably not a good idea. And, uh, and you're seeing more and more of this. I mean, it's been out for probably, what, 60 years, but uh, the Ouija board, it's, it's promoted as a game. You know, it was, it was promoted to children that they would call on these spirits to answer questions. Who thought of that? You know, oh, this would be a great idea. Let's, you know, why don't we just give kids a blowtorch to go play with? Um, horoscopes, reading your horoscope. Oh, that's that's harmless. No, it's not harmless. It's something that God says don't mess with. You know, and uh, yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And, and Satan is not going to come along and tell you the truth. All right. Satan is not going to come along and say, hey, you really ought to do this because it's going to mess up your life and you're going to die. You know, who's going to do that? No, he's going to come along and say, oh, wow, this looks so good. You know, he's going to do what he did to Eve in the garden. Did God really say that? Nah, nah. He says you're going to die. You're really going to live. I mean, he, he turns everything around. So, yeah, it's always packaged as something good. I remember back in the 80s when the New Age movement was really popular. The New Age movement was just old Eastern mysticism but it was packaged in a new way. And they figured out how to get Americans interested in Old Eastern mysticism. They put it in the trappings of science. And that's, the, that's another new emphasis you see. Well, it's not new, but a renewed emphasis. Everything is, oh, it's the science, yeah, whatever. Most of it's not even good science. Uh, but that's the way it's packaged to be acceptable and to be more pleasing. Ah. Yeah. That's a good question. question is, how can a demon inhabit a person, or what has to happen in order for that to take place? Um, Again, on this particular note, I cannot give a chapter and verse. My understanding is demons do not randomly possess individuals. I believe there must be a spiritual opening for them. Now, the spiritual opening does not have to be done by that person. And I have known of people who, as even infants, as very small children, 
their parents were dealing in the occult. They may have been Satan worshipers. They may have exposed them to satanic rituals, even as small children who were before they can make choices of their own. And that opens a door where Satan's, where demons can come in. Um, playing with Ouija boards, reading horoscopes, dabbling in the occult, these kinds of things open a door. I don't believe that demons just kind of randomly, oh, you know, I'm going to go there. I, I, I think that I, now again, I can't, I can't give you a chapter verse on this. I, I believe, though, that there needs to be an opening, um, and, and they will use that opening. Okay. The witch, yeah. Uh, of Endor, yes, yes, yeah. That's that's a very good, very good point. Uh, King Saul, near the end of his life, he knew that God had rejected him, and so he went and consulted with a witch at Endor. I think that's a very telling story, because he went to the witch and said, "Call up the spirit of Samuel." Samuel was the the prophet and the judge that actually coronated. Saul uh, was kind of Saul's mentor in his early days. He had died. Yes, um, Samuel. Yes, uh, broke Saul's heart when Samuel or broke Samuel's heart when Saul went bad. And so Saul asks the witch, "Call up Samuel." And it's the only time in the Bible where it appears that a spirit comes back from the dead in a sense like this. And I think it's very telling that the witch lost her mind. I mean, it says she screamed when Samuel actually came up. But why would she react that way? I mean, that's her job. You know, you think she sees that a lot. And I think it's because it was the real thing. <laughs> and she wasn't used to that. She was used to either playing a game or dealing with demons. And here was an actual spirit that came up. And Samuel said, what are you bothering me for? <laughs> um, I think that's a really, really telling uh, account in Scripture of, of how things work in the spirit realm. Yes, Denise. Right. Yes, good good point. There are many instances in the New Testament, particularly in the life of Jesus, where even young children we're not always given their age, but we you know, you get the impression that they're young children that are possessed. Um, how did that happen? I don't know. I, I just I just don't believe that it's random. Um, I believe that Somehow there is an opening that either they or someone else opens for them that enables that spirit to get in. So we've got to be careful what we expose ourselves to. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, question is, um, we, there are places in Scripture where angels seem to be fighting, battling. Uh, who are they fighting? And can they be killed? Um, are they fighting for us? Uh, I'm going to look at one Old Testament and then one New Testament passage. The Old Testament is in Daniel. Oops. Daniel. And I gotta find it, so give me a second. All right, Daniel chapter ten.
Uh, let's begin it right at the beginning of the chapter. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So there, this is a time where Daniel is, is, we would say, fasting and praying. And it went for three weeks. Now jump down to verse 12. An angel comes to Daniel. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Imagine this. Daniel begins to pray. He's fasting and praying. He's just devoting himself to God. The angel says, from that moment, your prayer was heard. There was no delay in God hearing your prayer, and God dispatched me to give you the answer. But I was confronted. Now it talks about the prince of Persia. He's speaking here not of a human, but of, a, of an angel. And a lot of the, they would speak of angels as being like over different nations, like angels would be assigned to a nation, and both good angels and bad angels. And this one angel detained God's angel. They were fighting. And it took Michael, the archangel, to come and to assist this, this good angel to overcome the demonic opposition. And, and it even took time. It took three weeks for all of this to take place. So yes, there's a battle going on. Um, and, and it's both good and bad angels. And they are fighting each other. All right, the battle again, the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's the, the spiritual battle that's taking place. Uh, now, if you turn in the New Testament to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, meaning Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Here's the battle. So you have God's angels fighting against Satan and his demons. And you have this constant spiritual conflict that's going on. I believe it was. Uh, there's different interpretations of that. You know, did this happen at the beginning of time? Did this happen when Jesus was here? Did this happen? Will it still happen in the future? Um, I think that it shows what happened at the beginning, but I think it might be something that is repeated where at different times Satan tries to go and overthrow God and every time he gets thrown down. Um, so it, there's, there is some competing interpretations of this, but what is very clear is that God's angels went out. Satan does not ever defeat God's angels. Now, are those angels killed? No. As spirit beings, they are not, they don't, are not put to death. Um, they are defeated, but they are not killed in that sense. So they live on to fight another day. Um, well, the, the good angels, yeah, the good angels have a place in God's house, in God's abode. Um, when John was taken to the throne room in Revelation, he saw angels around the throne. Tens of thousands of angels um, that were worshiping. So I think that uh, their home is in heaven. They get assignments and they come to earth and they do God's work, but their home is in heaven. The home of the demons is ultimately the lake of fire, 
which was prepared for the devil and his angels. So ultimately, that's where they'll end up. The ones that are in Tartarus, they're just being held there for judgment, but ultimately they'll be cast into the lake of fire as well. Uh, yes and no. I mean, ultimately, yes, they are serving God. But in serving God, they also minister to us. And the uh, book of Hebrews uh, points out that angels are ministering spirits to humans. Because the temptation back then was, let's worship angels. What are you worshiping angels for? God created them to serve us. Um, so, yes, they, you know, angels do work on our behalf, but it's always at God's direction. All right, this has been good, and I think we're running a little long, so we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you for your questions. I think this was, I hope it was helpful and enlightening. And uh, starting next week, we'll go back to our study in First Timothy, but we'll also have the question time during our song service that you can uh, bring some more questions. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing the truth in your word and for giving it to us so that we may understand to the degree that we can. I pray that you would help us to take what we've learned, that it would stay in our minds and that it would take root in our hearts and help us not only to know more, but help us to put this into practice in the decisions we make and the way that we live. Go with us now. Help us to be aware of the spiritual warfare that's going on around us, but not to be intimidated by it, remembering that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We pray this in the victorious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.